good uh, afternoon dear colleagues i'm sorry uh, i would grab a bottle of water uh, i will try to make this presentation uh, in a way that would be attractive for the community of interest to the community thus i would be speaking more about the news what is taking place what kind of new things are appearing for the i access and how can that be used well i'd like to mention uh, let us touch on how were we se uh, selecting the new platform which is supposed to be completed by the end of the current year we would also talk about various ports, uh, 100 uh, gigabit, uh, whether they are good and convenient or they are, it's worthwhile to be looking at these speeds and what kind of uh, challenges there might be in there as well as there are various protoc BFD protocol and SDNs that uh, are being mentioned or talk, discussed a lot and whether you can use this and how useful it is in this uh, period of time. Of course, we'll touch on the attacks, what kind of tools and approaches we have uh, in available, uh, available to us and what can be done in the future. If we look at the topology, our technical department is always uh, encountering a challenging task of selection of a vendor, changes of the speed, as well as selection of the topology that would not only meet the current needs, but also I guess and forecast the development for a number of years and allow us for the scalability of the system. We were looking at a number of networks. We were trying to draw topology, various topological pictures. And you can imagine that IX at the early in the early days had a ring topology and you could see that the diameter of the network uh, is the possibility of interconnectivity between any two segments of the network it was quite uh, big all the packets were going through all of the ring which was not very effective we were using the communication channels that was uh, not very convenient looking through various options, we conclude that, that at the moment a uh, layout with a number of cores uh, in the network uh, would be most convenient that do not have res uh, any kind of uh, burden responsibility for connecting end user ports, but are interconnecting nodes that allow us to uh, parallel the nodes in the system. And the nice thing about it is that the number of those cores can be increased depending on the uh, on the burden on the use of capacity capacity to various uh, points and the topology we are building uh, uh, allows uh, to cover the needs for quite a long period of time but allows to reconsider later here yeah, talking about the topology we are building of course we looked at number of rings various protocols we see that the layout was not very optimal but it was growing by means of adding new nodes new uh, locations and that was what we ended up having through the process and on the right is what uh, the layout to which we ma we are switching slow or smoothly now. In the core, we have two commutating units, uh, central cores that are located to energetically independent sites, uh, remote from one another, and, may and all nodes are in mandatory way are being connected with all those with both of those cores. Thus, we are not just uh, uh, providing for the the workload, uh, breaking down the workload, but also are providing for the reliability if one of those nodes would uh, get out of the work. And that way, the work of the specific access points is not influencing others. And on top of tier 0 and tier 1, you see those commutator units. And tier 2 are the so-called branches that allow us to launch in a mobile quite quickly new points, new nodes and then slowly building them into our infrastructure with minimal, at the minimal costs. 
the stages he went through are also evident. We had to reconsider our fiber optic communication channels. We had to organize new protocol types and the challenging tasks we were faced with was not just building a new layout, but the integration with existing equipment. In here, we've studied the possibilities of the protocols that uh, would not influence uh, negatively the existing, uh, the old existing equipment, and thus we have implemented MLAG protocols that allow us to go into uh, this layout and and go away from the pre the older protocols, and thus uh, here you can see the specifics of our transition. You see on the graph uh, quite a simple measurement system that was measuring ping to the node, and uh, since we've moved into this new core. Uh, it it's evident that the diameter of the network went down, the speed increased, the, the response time has decreased, and we have seen the advantage at this, even at this stage. I would like to touch on an interesting aspect that we have encountered in the process of implementing this layout. Uh, quite an unusual thing. Possibly few of you have encountered this. This is so-called polarization of hash functions when you are using balancing algorithm. And for example, the topology you see on the screen are two, no, uh, uh, two cores, B and C, and some uh, node A is trying to transfer the traffic to D node. There are there is a balancing that breaks down to eight channels, four per every of the cores, and at and every node also getting the, is having its own balancing algorithm at both B and C. And whenever there we are using the similar balancing algorithm at all those four nodes, we are having an interesting picture. And it turns out that the traffic goes in an unbalanced uh, manner, for example, from A to B. Oh, some of those channels are overloaded, some are not. And the specifics is valid uh, for all of the vendors. It's actually uh, true for we are in the, it's actually implemented in the in various chips because various chips are having different balancing algorithms, different methodology for resolving of the challenges being used. Here I show you the three main approaches for resolving the issue of polarization. First is adding random uh, value C to, to the algorithm. The, basically, the task is to change the functions of that wouldn't be giving the same results. It's either changing the uh, value or the change algorithm, the balancing, or use various communication lines that are also one of the parameters of the function. Moving on from details of our migration, uh, let me talk a little about the history of the <laughs> the current situation with the development of the speeds. Uh, it's not a secret that Ix is uh, a little bit um, ahead of other technologies. So we deal with the speeds which the most, most of our operators uh, will have to deal uh, a little later, uh, sometimes they lag behind the speeds which, which are uh, around. And uh, we uh, consider speeds and we look at uh, where technologies are developing. And uh, you can see that, uh, look in this uh, graph, uh, which uh, we took from one of our sources, uh, our working groups, we s uh, the group who uh, develops uh, standards, we see that the server speed and the network speed, they do not grow together. A uh, server speed grows not that fast and uh, network speed uh, grows faster. So you know the standards, they were the uh, 10, 40, 100 standard gigabits for the wireless technology. For example, there are two standards, 2.5 and 5 gigabytes. And this idea is one of the reasons of developing these standards uh, in order to use those copper uh, wire networks 
which uh, have been built already and they are used for connecting the same uh, points of access. And uh, so they invented two more standards. For the servers, yes, uh, there is 25 uh, gigabit standard. It's some kind of a transitional <coughs> standard in, in when you don't have t uh, when 10 gigabits is uh, not not enough, but 40 gigabits too expensive. As for the networks, yes, uh, we are going to uh, the 40 gigabytes per second. This is the standard which is now being discussed very actively in the nearest future. Uh, we will uh, have it, I think. As for our uh, 100 gigabits uh, solutions, now we have implemented uh, 100 gigabytes ports, and uh, we looked at different solutions, and uh, we did uh, we. Uh, uh, so the first, first generation modules, we didn't use them, so we moved on to the uh, second generation modules. And, uh, and uh, right now we have uh, 32 uh, ports. We can support it within one unit. And of course, it consumes less energy and it allows us gradually uh, move without any changing infrastructure. Uh, move on without changing electric uh, schemes. And uh, uh, let me talk about a bit of the pluses and minuses of these speeds. <clears throat> yes, speed grows. Uh, it's, it's clear the uh, energy efficiency is good. But the minuses are the second generation is limited uh, in terms of distance, and the first generation. Um, for, for us, uh, it was important that it's uh, 10, 10 kilometers distance, and which is not big distance. And the second is uh, the equipment price is quite high, and implementation is uh, doesn't happen as uh, quickly as we would like it to be. And. And uh, it's uh, interesting to notice that uh, what you do if your port is overloaded, and God forbid it happens on the 100 gigabytes uh, speed. This is the graph of an our clients, that, uh, and we found out that the port is overloaded, so you have to connect second port, but the second port is uh, expensive. You cannot buy it very quickly. Uh, you have to do something to uh, combine this port with the 100 uh, gigabytes. So you cannot uh, build one either channel. So either you go back to 10 gigabytes uh, until you and, and wait until you can buy the second port or find some other solutions, uh, buy expensive equipment, install one more port for 100 gigabytes. <coughs> Moving on. Uh, let me say a couple of words about the SDN technology. And we are following what's going on in this area. And uh, our company participates in forum, uh, EuroIX uh, forum, uh, uh, participants of which are, are discussing very actively the implementation of SDN technology, including a number of IX uh, had conducted a number of research researchers and uh, what we are uh, noticing for ourselves uh, that it's clear that the, the technology is developing and uh, some time will pass and this technology will reach uh, will be successful and we will revise uh, look at this situation different angle now yes this technology is good it uh, allows to separate management or controlling uh, from commutation. At the same time, there is a problem that uh, the controller is separate and the network is separate. And if something happens, what should you do and who is responsible for it? So we have had these situations already when we uh, installed active DVDN and uh, when we were looking for who was responsible for it, the vendor producer who supplied this equipment or the active DVDN. Uh, everybody was uh, trying to uh, push the blame on the opponent. Uh, from the viewpoint of reliability, it's critical things. And now we uh, we have software and hardware from uh, from the same people from the same company. And um, when 
it will be from different sources and it will be controlled uh, differently. So it will increase flexibility, but uh, at the same time, it will complicate uh, our work if there is any problem or mistake or error. Uh, BFD protocol, well, a lot of you know about it and if some of you don't know and don't use it i would recommend you to familiarize with it try to implement it it's important for the infrastructure useful for the infrastructure where you need quite a quick uh, identifications of the uh, uh, invalid routes and in order to cut off the routes which are at the moment either have uh, channel problems or uh, some hardware problems but uh, to cut it off quickly according to the BGP protocol yesterday we talked about it and we talked about when the BGP be replaced but you don't you don't have to change the BGP BFD protocol helps to solve <clears throat> some subtle uh, subtle things which cannot be uh, tackled with the BGP. In our implementation, we managed to tune parameters and we managed to cut the response time in, in five, six times the response time. Uh, that some uh, a route can be inaccessible and to cut off this route and not use it uh, in work. As for the root server, uh, as for the root server, we have implemented these timers. Uh, you can make them s uh, smaller, but there is the question of the workload on processor, and so this is the research issue. And uh, we think that these parameters are the most important. So we found an error on Cisco equipment. We use some uh, two addresses in IX and on the secondary interface and on the secondary BFD wasn't supported. And in some uh, versions they have corrected uh, it and uh, there are some remedies and they implemented new command so you can go and see this. A recommendation is for the idea, development idea of BFD. Uh, I heard on one of the Euro Ike's for forum that they say that Ix is just uh, like an uh, uh, arbiter on this, so it's like a server to which a lot of participants are connected, but it can't. In some cases, you can control the, the uh, point of uh, packets uh, passing from one participant to the other, especially if there is a problem on the side of the participant. It is uh, very often networks of partic arts participants. They are distributed networks, and they have a lot of switchboards, switches, and uh, they have some specific uh, tunings. And uh, so sometimes we see that the traffic cannot go from one provider to the other. And uh, the method which we use now, we monitor traffic from the both ends and show operator that the problem is not about our infrastructure, it's uh, your problem, so you have to take care of it. And usually they identify the reason very quickly and the operators, uh, providers can find where the error is. The idea offered by community is uh, to implement uh, some kind of a protocol sig signaling uh, using the BFD protocol, the connection between two end operate IX operators uh, and to uh, inform BFD about it. And after that, uh, excuse me, if, uh, use BGP for the road service. And the road server will not give the routes which um, uh, go nowhere because they're not connected, for example. We'll see. We'll see. It's kind of a draft. Uh, we'll see what, what is going on. As for the DDoS protection of IX, we have implemented black hole filtering. Uh, it's quite a simple scheme is shown here, uh, which is realized. Uh, it's, uh, for, for example, the hackers trying to send a lot of packages to some kind of a, uh, to servers of the victim, and the road server uh, to which uh, victim uh, reports that it's been attacked and it informs the community so this information is being sent around on the BGP protocol to all IX participants and they on their routers uh, send the traffic to special 
uh, next hop and this traffic is uh, blocked on the um, entrance to the IX. So we solved the problem of the extra load on the IX and uh, we help operator which is attacked. Uh, so it's clear that uh, it's, uh, it's a good solution, but it doesn't solve the problem completely, but at least it uh, solves the problem of the work of the whole infrastructure. Uh, it doesn't need a uh, um, complicated infrastructure, info configuration, uh, but uh, all uh, operators should uh, uh, take the slash 32 route. Uh, we have quite strict policy of our road server, so that is why everything which we announce, what is uh, everything which is road server is announced, you can accept it without hesitation. It filters quite uh, well uh, ICE macro and uh, prefixes. And uh, according to our analysis, we see that 85% 85, 85 of operators, uh, they accept this. Uh, routes and the traffic goes where it should. So the and we are using this method in on our points. And uh, let me add that uh, you can use it on the private peerings. Uh, there must be an agreement between two operators according to the BGP protocol, so that they can use some special filter address, and you have it on the screen. Uh, some words about uh, testing the anti-attack technologies we have tested and we are looking, we're continuously looking for new solutions. Uh, we see what's going on on the market and last year we looked at uh, solutions uh, about the perimeters of anti-DDoS uh, attacks perimeter and uh, summing up uh, and everything which I said, uh, not only just about this specific solution, but in general about the technology of protection technologies, uh, I can say that you can in future have this technology and uh, this technology can be integrated uh, into the road service technology. But the main problem of the implementation of such solutions is that <clears throat> the price of the hardware is quite high. And um, now uh, the participants are not ready to pay such money. Uh, it's, uh, they're not ready to pay such price. So we are open for proposals. We are looking for solutions. And uh, if you have more efficient solutions, uh, we definitely will find a way how to implement it. And the future, which we all are interested in, this is uh, 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 filtering technology, which uh, helps to solve the problem of uh, attack protection. It's a uh, flow spec technology, which allows to uh, create filters based on uh, the data which we have about the tech, and it helps quite efficiently to protect uh, uh, through the uh, filtering the content and the protocols and ports which are being attacked. Uh, initially, uh, it was developed by Juni and Arbor, uh, but recently it has been uh, developed on uh, other hardware, on Cisco, and uh, uh, it has some peculiarities in uh, implementation, which I would like to tell you about. This technology does not like mistakes, errors. It has the problem with reliability if you have launched uh, a big filter and it can be quite difficult uh, to re realize it on some hardware. You can lose packages, but Cisco have done one more thing. It's uh, BGP persistence. Uh, for example, when you uh, realize uh, you activate some filter and there is an attack and this attack changed the vector and the equipment uh, suddenly destroyed the network, all filters disappeared and okay, the attack doubled. So there is a persistent system which allows to uh, hold this attack uh, until you restore your all protecting capabilities. And in conclusion, let me say that our company this year will celebrate its 20th anniversary. And uh, let me congratulate my staff 
uh, our people and I uh, wish uh, all of us uh, go forward, uh, go uh, in step with the uh, time and market. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexander. So we're lagging behind with our time a little bit, but we do have time for one question, a quick one. But please introduce yourself. Uh, Court of Alexander Vodafone, uh, Sasha, I have a question about DDoS. MSKX, uh, so it works only with the participants and MKX. And potentially look at technologies which gives uh, your clients the server. If one of your clients is being attacked, you can protect your client only from the attacks which are being generated by the MSKX clients, but not from the rest of the world. So. Uh, so what you do, uh, how, how can you provide the complete service? Uh, yes, IX is a platform, exchange platform, and uh, among our services, so we have branches of our company. Uh, we can uh, do it in other ways and organize some other channels of communication. And as an option, you can consider this service as the uh, organization the virtual link for this operator which is attacked uh, and filter not just the traffic which goes through ix but also which ones goes comes from other operators through organizing a separate channel uh, a separate vlan within the uh, skx uh, and this vlan and uh, the vlan will take the take uh, internet from Telecom, other company, and the VLAN can be used from there, clean it up, and then return it. Yes. Uh, 